So, hi everybody, welcome to the Statistical Society of Australia's October webinar. I'm Susanna Cram, I'll be the chair for today. Thank you for joining us. We're very excited to be hearing from Mark Griffin speaking about business analytics today. So, just a couple of items before we start. So, I just want to advertise our next couple of upcoming webinars. So, our next one's on Monday, the 18th of November at 12 pm ADT. It's featuring Agus Salim. And on December 3rd, very excited to announce we have Sir Professor David Spiegelholter speaking at 7 pm AEDT. So see the website for further details. Um, secondly, we're really keen to hear what you guys want for our webinar speakers. And so the October e-newsletters question is actually, who do you want for a webinar speaker? So please do go and enter your uh, preferences in that. Uh, finally, just as Mark said, please do keep your microphones muted throughout. Use the chat box to type in any comments or questions you have throughout. I'll be reading these out to Mark right at the end. And he will also be getting a log of everything you say in that as well, just so you're aware. And so it's an absolute pleasure to have Mark speaking today. Mark's the co-chair of the Business Analytics section within the Statistical Society of Australia. He's also the co-chair of our 2020 conference. Mark teaches business analytics within the University of Queensland School of Business. He's also the director of his own business analytics company. Mark has considerable experience providing training in analytics to a range of stakeholders, including statisticians, business analysts, and business managers. So thank you, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Susanna. And as Susanna was said, so today we're talking about, as you're going to see in front, on the screen in front of you, introduction to business analytics beyond statistical analysis. So the aim of this webinar, so, so we're all conscious about the rapid growth of business analytics in the sense of, for, for, the, for our audience today, we don't need to talk about, I mean, we already know about the rapid growth of analytics, the um, big data, the role of big data plays within the industry today. And again, sort of those key, the, the, the three key Vs, the, three key Vs of big data, the volume velocity for our data. As we start looking at the field of business analytics, it's important also to recognize that, and remember that the field of business analytics, really the methods of which come from three domains, statistics, data mining, operations research, obviously coming from the Statistical Society of Australia, then we come into that sort of picture from that statistics domain. So, um, so with the audience that we have today, there may well be people who come from one or more other fields within business analytics who are take, take, taking part in the conversation today. While there are those, those three parties in the field of business analytics, the fields of the terms of business analytics, the fields of data science, my personal feeling, and I'll stress throughout this webinar that there's a lot that I'm gonna be presenting, which is my own opinion, I'll come back to that. But my personal feeling, is that our friends, our colleagues in IT have a much louder voice in the space of analytics than we do, that we tend to be, many of us tend to be introverted, quieter by nature. And so in, our, in conversations around business analytics, we tend to have a quieter voice. And I'd like to challenge us throughout this webinar that maybe what, than what we can be doing to actually to be developing a louder voice in the space. So into the second point, again, what is business analytics? What can we be doing with our latter voice? Again, I'm gonna be sharing a number of things which are my own personal opinion throughout this webinar. I don't expect that we all can agree on, these, on some of these, these things that I'm raising, but if I've challenged you in your own thinking, then that's the purpose of this webinar. Unfortunately, this slide, there was a video which was, um, which was working fine last week, Today, we've just realized just before the webinar that the sound is not coming, going to come through. It's a, it's a five minute on a funny video about what is business analytics. Um, and so when you get the, um, the slides, the recording of this webinar, at, um, whenever Susanna um, sends us out after the webinar, we'll make sure that we have that video in case you want to go back and see it and have a look at it. What is business analytics? Within the management domain, there's a statement which has almost become cliche. The, the statement of what you can't measure, you can't manage. And so more and more, as you all know, organizations are aware that they have huge amounts of, huge volumes of data. Um, and we sort of refer to the term in big data. I'll come back to big data in just a moment. Big data, the, the idea that a lot, of this data, a lot of these data remain unanalyzed. And so what are the interesting stories? How can decision, how can business managers be making 
better decisions within the organisations if they can understand the pictures present within this data. As an aside, I should comment on big data, and you're probably all aware of this yourselves, but the, the notion that there's actually two related meanings of big data that is out there within the community. So we, so we as, as statisticians, we are very aware of the technical aspects of what is big data. The term big data specifically means that the volume, the amount of data we have, the velocity, the speed at which data enters our organization, that our traditional methods of computer hardware, computer software, are not capable of dealing with, with data of that volume and velocity. And unfortunately, that term is sort of often washed out a little bit when people talk about big data within, I mean, if you're talking to people in business in big data, then they'll often water down that description. They'll focus on the volume and velocity, saying, yes, we have seen, we, we're working on data sets larger than what we have seen before, but won't necessarily be using big data to specifically mean not just is the data bigger, it's actually bigger than our hardware is, and our software is able to cope with. So again, those two descriptions of big data that are throughout there. As I've said before, analytics uses methods of statistics, data mining, and operations research. So we are one field that is generating the methods of this analytics. And when we look at the evolution of business analytics, often we sort of characterize business analytics, the methods of business analytics, and the types of, the types of research questions that we're asking using business analytics into three domains, descriptive analytics, predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics. The simplest way of describing this is that predictive analytics, uh, sorry, descriptive analytics, ask the question of what happened in the past. If I've measured variables X and Y in the past, I can create, I, know, I can create a model such as a linear regression model to describe that relationship between X and Y. What does that model look like? Predictive analytics says if what's happened in the past continues to happen, what will happen in the future? If I'm within a company and I'm interested in measuring sales, if I see a difference between what happened between the growth of being in 2019, how many sales did I have in 2017? How many sales did I have in 2018? If that growth increases, then how many, how many sales will I have in 2019, in 2020? Now we're going, now again using models such as our, our linear regression model, using it to sort of say, can we understand the, the relationship between 2017, 2018? And then can I use that to say, predict this from 2019, can I use those to predict what will happen in 2020? So again, using, using the same models, the regression models, in that predictive manner. Prescriptive analytics asks the question of, what do I need you to do today to produce the optimal outcome in the future? If we're interested in sales tomorrow, what are the things that we can change today? What can we do, to, for example, to invest in marketing, to invest in product development? What different, different business decisions can I do today to predict, to obtain the best outcome tomorrow? And these are the methods of nominee optimization, the methods of operations research used to explore descriptive analytics. Often when we think about analytics projects, and this is typically happens predominantly for people who are actually outside analytics, the thing that people often hang their hat on, that focus on when they think about analytics, is the data analysis. Once I've got a data set, how do I analyze that to find the, the patterns present with that data set? I'm gonna pack this over the next few slides, but I would actually argue that that's only one part of analytics. And there's actually a number of stages. We talk about the processes of identifying the research question. Again, I'll come back to, to unpack that. Sourcing the data, analyzing the data, data reporting and visualization, and create and turning that knowledge into business value. Again, we'll come back and we'll unpack that. One of the things I wanted to say before I unpack that is contrast that with what a stereotypical university assignment in statistics looks like. And I sort of can't, I'm, my personal opinion is that we often, within statistics degrees, focus on the data analysis, 
we don't tend to capture it all, to, to describe it all with our students, that larger context of where the statistics fit into that larger picture. So a stereotypical, a stereotypical university assignment, student is given a very specific research question, the data set all ready for analysis, the variables all ready to use, as in they're told which variables to use in the analysis, and sometimes even the name of the methods. The student analyzes the data, and as a bit of a, on a bonus point throwaway extra, they write some very brief comment on the results. And the student doesn't think at all about the demographics that they're communicating their results to. Are we showing these results to work colleagues, to managers, the general public? How do we communicate those results to different people? And we'll come back to them. But also the student doesn't think at all about, well, what's the, the people who are hearing these results? What types of decisions are they going to make as a result? All those things, those aspects don't tend to get captured with an ACIS assignment. And so again, my personal feeling is that with an assisted course, students learn a lot about the methodology of data analysis. They don't tend to look at all at how to identify interesting research questions, how do I communicate those results to stakeholders, that bigger picture. The other thing which students often don't learn is in the space of statistical consulting, as a statistical consultant myself, 90% of my time is working with people, and about 10% of my time is working on novel methodology. And I must confess that I sometimes struggle with the idea that students are taught statistics, they're not taught those methodology, that interpersonal within communication involved in consulting. As, as all of that as an aside. Identifying the research question. Now let's compare the a couple of the, the classic scenarios that we have within statistics. Again, that stereotypical assignment. The research question is phased in a very clearly stated manner. So clearly stated that there's no ambiguity for students over what that means. As a statistical consultant, we, we, we think about the term, we, we might think about the term identifying the research question, but in reality, for most statistical consultants, what do they mean by that question, that terminology? What they generally mean is that the consultant in a stereotypical meeting comes into their office, the client, the person we're doing work for, already has in the back of their mind the research question, Though they, some, though they often don't know how to phrase that, how to phrase that in a way that makes sense to us as statisticians, often in a way that makes sense to them. They know what in the back of my mind what they're wanting to do. They're not, not sort of sure how to sort of verbalize that. And indeed, it does require skill as a consultant, a statistical consultant, to tease out from the client exactly what they're looking for, that research question, in a way that makes sense to us, in a way that we can document, both for our own analysis and also for the report after we've done the data analysis to say, this is what the client was asking for. Well, we think of this as the identifying the research question. I would actually go back a step further to what it really means to identify the research question. And I think that in business analytics, we need to be even more proactive in seeking the research question. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, can we attend business meetings, read business reports, talk to stakeholders, observe stakeholders in their everyday business environments? Can we work out not just the research question, but what precedes that? What's the overall business strategy? What's the direction the business is heading in? What types of decisions are stakeholders making? Hence, can we listen to that process and propose what would be interesting research questions to ask? In some of the most problematic workplaces I've seen, and again, this, I, I paint this as pure stereotype, a group of data scientists, sometimes within a business, a, it's a common scenario, within a business, a business recognises they have a very large volume of data. They'll sort of find somebody who knows something about statistics or something about data mining and simply say to them, we have this huge data set, we, um, we have this huge data set, see what you can do with it. And as a stereotype, in that scenario, and I've been in that been this position myself, what will I do? 
if I'm simply told do something interesting with this data set, what I will do is simply what's something which is interesting mathematically. Interesting is it something that's interesting that data miners, statisticians would find that there's novel methodology being um, being introduced. The problem with this scenario is that this is interesting mathematically, but the work, for the most part, offers no true business value for the for the business. What this means is that it might be an interesting project, but it hasn't helped people who are making business uh, business decisions. It hasn't helped them to make better decisions in light of that work. Again, a stereotypical example. Sourcing the data. Now, one of my favourite authors in the space in the space of analytics is a guy called Tom Davenport. Tom Davenport is a professor over at MIT. He's written quite a number of books in the space of analytics. In one of his books, which I believe is the book Keeping Up with the Quants, Tom Davenport, in one of his chapters, describes a competition won by Netflix. Within the Netflix contest, teams of students or teams of data scientists were asked to develop software for, the, for predicting what movies would most, appeal, would most appeal to individual customers. Obviously, obviously, if Netflix is able to, the better Netflix is able to make those predictions, the more customers would be interested in what Netflix has to offer them. The more sales that Netflix can make to, can make to customers, the more, the more attention of customers Netflix can, can make. With this, one team, so one of the many teams involved in that contest, is a highly advanced physical procedure. They were very novel in terms of the, the mathematical algorithm which they produced. Another team decided they wouldn't just use the data provided to them by Netflix. They also obtained additional data, which they sourced themselves in order to make that prediction. In that scenario, probably fairly obvious which team won the competition. The team that used that additional data, that data which also contained interesting stories about what types of predictions, what types of movies might appeal to customers. Interestingly, within this contest, that team that used the additional data were disqualified because they cheated according to the rules of the contest. This all goes to prove the point, to demonstrate the point, that often a lot of gains can be made if we're trying to predict something within an analytics um, procedure. There's gains being made, obviously, from novel methodology in terms of the stats, but there are also huge gains being made. If we can think about what data is present, what data is present within our organisation? What data is present within the organisations we reimburse that might be useful in that prediction? Another example of this, one of the projects I work on, I work with, is with the evaluation team of the Queensland Ambulance Service. What does Queensland Ambulance Service do? At the start of each day, what they'll do is they log on to the website for the Bureau of Meteorology. What's the weather like today? Is it a hot day? Is it a sunny day? Is it a rainy day? These things will obviously have an impact on what types of accidents or what types of incidents the ambulances will be called to in that particular day. So how can we think proactively about what data is present within our organisation, what data is present within the organisations around us? The data analysis. I actually believe, well, in some senses, the most important stage. Most important stage, but again, if the question is asked wrong, um, the, the question, the research question, is not of value to stakeholders. If the data is not useful data for, for the data analysis, then that weakens the power that comes through from data analysis. So again, um, within this webinar, we're only going to look briefly, we're only going to look at this one slide of data analysis, and many of you can teach me a lot of things about the methodology involved in data analysis. But again, the key point, that this is only one stage of many involved in business analytics. Next stage, data reporting and visualization. Now, for the most part, well, at least my experience, my experience of the people around me, my experience in a lot of cases of work which I've done or work which I've done in the past, often the, the results coming out of basic analysis are so complicated in themselves that we just tend to focus on how do we phrase, describe the results 
in a way that's a clear description of the results. But we don't tend to think about who are the people who are reading our results. And with that, not just this one group, one group of readers, who are the different groups of readers within our organisation? If you think about the Queensland, again, going about the Queensland Ambulance Service, who are the different stakeholders in that? The different stakeholders, some of which being, if we want to analyse the incidents, the active incidents the ambulance service saw in the last year, what would the, are the ambulance drivers like to know about? What would managers like to know about? What would the general public like to know about? And how do we communicate in those different ways to those different stakeholders? As we think about different stakeholders, there are a number of dimensions in which they vary. Again, the research questions, what are they interested in knowing about a big data set? But in addition, their ability or their eagerness to understand or learn complex statistical concepts. I think that I'm probably like many of you in that if somebody says to me statistics, more than happy to enter a five hour dialogue, five hour monologue on the meaning of the subtleties in statistics. We need to think about our audience. Some of our audience would love to hear that five hour monologue. Some of our audience want to just simply see a quick snapshot. They don't have the time or they don't have the eagerness, they don't have the willingness to learn to understand or learn complex statistical concepts. The amount of time they have available, some people want to see a rich story coming out of a data set. Some people don't have time for that. And the timeliness of reports. Different stakeholders, different research questions. Do they want the results in real time or they just want an annual report? If I'm a senior executive, maybe, it may be a lot of cases, I just simply want an annual report on every project in my domain. However, if I'm in charge of a factory floor, and a machine breaks down. I don't want to know a year later. I want to know as soon as it's happened, what machine has broken down, what can I do about it, how do I action that in real time. And then the process of turning data into knowledge into business value. It might be a bit of a cliche statement in statistics, but I've often heard statistics being described as the process of turning data into knowledge. And my personal feeling is that if business managers, people making business decisions, simply have more knowledge, then that is completely useless. What do I mean by that? What, business, what people who are making decisions need is the ability to make better business decisions as a result of our, of our analytics. If we're just giving stakeholders more knowledge, then that's an important part of the picture but it doesn't go the full, way, the full length to what stakeholders need. Stakeholders need what, what decisions should, should I be making as a result of this analytics, even if that decision is simply to support that they should continue doing whatever they're doing at present. How do we turn that knowledge into business value? I should also say that as a consultant, that I've written many reports and I fear that many reports I write are excellent reports, but just simply end up sitting on a stakeholder's desk, never being read, never having an impact on the business. So what can I, as a statistician, do to make sure that I not only do I produce an excellent report, that report turns into action as a result? And so this is more than just clever reporting. How do we work with stakeholders? How do we understand how they operate so that we can generally produce true business value. So this often means asking stakeholders what we can do to make better businesses, what we can do to help them make better business decisions. But we need to understand the process of what they're going to do with our port, what, was, what, were they, what decisions can be made, but when, where and how of those decisions, and hence how can we best influence those, those decisions. So to see those five stages as the stages within an analytics project. But above that, there's the process of how do we grow the capacity and capability of staff, their knowledge, their skills, their attitudes towards analytics. Ultimately, we need, ultimately organizations need a clear business strategy if we want to head with analytics. In a paper written by Davenport last year, he did a survey of company executives 
and their attitudes towards data. Of these, of the, of the, of the survey respondents, virtually all respondents, about 99%, said that all the, all the companies are seeking to become more data driven. In contrast, only about one third had succeeded in this objective. And the thing which is interesting about that sort of survey was he unpacked that further and he found that most of the time it wasn't the stats, it wasn't the IT, it wasn't the mathematics which was the biggest hurdle within organisations. Often the biggest hurdle was the organisations did not have a clear business strategy for how to go the capacity and capability in analytics. They recognised they want to do, they want to have capacity and capability. They didn't have a clear strategy for how they would get there as an organisation. As we start looking at those five stages within a project, one stage of that bigger picture, analytics, who are, the, who are the stakeholders? Who are the actors in this field? And as I do this, I should, I should clearly say that what I'm presenting is a generic, stereotypical, typical picture. Obviously, each specific workplace will be a variation on this general thing. Our data scientists. So as data scientists ourselves, we're experts in IT or experts in statistics, we're experts in the data analysis, but we have limited expertise in identifying those resource questions, in maximizing the value, the business value from analytics. We're often also not taught about how do we develop a business strategy for analytics for our organization. And once at the side of the data scientists, there's the business analysts. And so when Susanna introduced me at the start of the webinar, I'm specifically training business analysts within the School of Business who are which interested in saying, how do we interact with the data scientists who will be our future colleagues? Business analysts, the interface between the data scientists and that wider organization. The business managers, and business managers can be anywhere from you know, the team leader supervising six to 10 staff, all the way through to senior executives in charge for a multi-billion dollar company, business managers working on developing that business strategy, creating that company culture, a company culture receptive of analytics. We also have the subject matter experts. A business analyst seeks to understand the business as a whole, but if you look at particular areas of the business, we look at human resources, we look at marketing, we look at finance, who are the subject matter experts? Who knows about, who know about those specific areas that can help the business analysts, can help the data scientists understand those aspects of the organization. We then have, again, the, that, that largest um, demographic, the, the organization employees, even the wider public, people who are going to, who may be suggesting research questions, things that a company should might want to consider within their business decision making people who might be um, making use of or be affected by the results from analytics, people who may, who may well be providing data from analytics. As we think about that business strategy for growing that capacity and capability, as we start to unpack what's the, how do we develop that strategy, so the sort of comments and questions asked within any, within any work group of an organisation, can we define a clear set of work duties? What does the job of a data scientist look like? What does the job of a business analyst look like within an organization? Who are the people that we should employ? And what skill sections should they have? And communication. I mean, it's always intriguing. When I first heard about this, the field of statistics many decades ago, then I thought, yes, statistics was all about the equations and numbers. But, but in statistics, just like many other technical fields, how do, we, how do we work on communication? How do we work on communication to understand what the client needs in the first place? How do we work on communication to, to communicate back to, stay, back to stakeholders what we found the method, and the methodology that we've used? How do we motivate staff to join our organization and to remain working for our organization? What are staff looking for? If they're going to join your, if you have an analytics team, you're wanting staff to join your team. What are, look, what are, what are possible job candidates are looking for out of a workplace? And what sort of training do people want or networking opportunities that people 
would, uh, would benefit from or would enjoy uh, looking for. As we look at that organizational structure, and again, I'm now looking at that sort of very big picture within the organization. It's a bit of an open question as to where to put analytic staff within an organization. Do we have a, do we have a central silo? Do we sort of say, here's one work group, all the analytics people within that organization, within that one work group? That means that between data scientists and, and the business analysts around us, we can share our learning, our learning of what data sets are around, our learning of the methodology and the software and other tools and techniques. On the other hand, we can take that analytics team, divide them between the different work groups. Here's some people over in marketing, some people over in finance, some people over in human resources. In doing that, we, the, uh, our stakeholders, our, the members of our analytics team, are seeing how people in on it, on it, people in the workforce are using analytics, how they want to engage with analytics, what, how we can, imp, we can te help better tease out the research questions from them, we can better communicate back to them the results from analytics. And ultimately, within, as we think about that idea, do we want to have one central team? Do we want to divide the team? Each workplace will be different. What sort of communication do you want to improve within the organization? Hence, how do you think about that analytic staff? Where to put them in the organization in order to help achieve them? This is a strategy, fear of analytics. Now, I must confess, and this only happened a couple of years ago, when I first heard about, um, I don't know, people had a fear of analytics, I must confess that I just simply put this down to simple ignorance. I couldn't see why people would be afraid of analytics. Nowadays, I think there's actually very rational fear of analytics within organisations. Very rational fear for a number of reasons. One is that we actually, there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, this term, which some of you will have heard, digital disruption. Digital, digital dis disruption is both relevant for organisations and it's relevant for individual people. We have our suspicions, but in reality, we don't know what the future will look like. We don't know what the jobs of the future will look like. I'm sure that when we had the Industrial Revolution, and I apologise for making this right now, whether it's 100, 200 years ago, when we had the Industrial Revolution, I'm sure that at that stage, people went through a similar, went through a similar experience, not knowing how the work duties of their day would change as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So as we think about the, the role of analytics, and again, I won't sort of quote, quote too many stats, but if we think about things like the Internet of Things, if you look at the room which you're in right now, wherever you are, what, what, sort, of, what, what sort of things will you have in your room? You'll have air conditioning devices, you'll have security devices, you've obviously got your computer. If you have a kitchen, what sort of electronic device do you have in the room? How many of them might be connected to the Internet of Things? What sort of data is actually being collected within the organisation? As we think about the, that, rate, that rate of which we're collecting, the, the rate at which our jobs are changing. If you had told me when I was a kid that one day we'd have self dropping cars, that we'd have artificial intelligence being legalised in order to do this, I just wouldn't have believed you. And the question comes that if we have computers of today, driving our cars of today, what does that mean for the future? Does that mean that our boardroom of the future where is the role of the computer? Artificial intelligence. If computers can drive cars, in the future, can they drive, can they drive businesses? But even before we get to that scenario, let's go back to what we said earlier about a common scenario within the, within an analytics group. Again, a very stereotypical example, but a group of data, data scientists are given a data set and are told to do something interesting with it. They might do fantastic work, using novel methodology, developing novel methodology. But if, this, if the results they're producing don't impact the business decision making, how is the company going to perceive analytics? Is the company going to want to say, fantastic, we want to invest more time, more money into the same type of product, or will they question the value produced by that stereotypical analytics group? So hence, is there a fear in analytics? So as we approach the end of this webinar, 
as we approach the end of the seminar. Let's consider our role in business analytics. As that position, we need to move beyond our models, equations, and numbers. What I mean by that is, what I, I don't mean by that that we on it. On it obviously, we, we don't abandon our models, equations, and numbers. But I think we need to, again, again, my own personal opinion, my own personal experience, we need to stop defining our wall as just the models, equations, and numbers. What can we be doing to have a louder voice in what, where analytics fits within our organisation? What can we be doing to understand what sort of research questions are being, being asked within an organisation? Or even before that, what's the business strategy? Where is our organisation heading? Hence, what can we be doing with data to help support where that business is heading? And how do we communicate that? The results of analytics, the methodology that, that's being used, even things such as the, well, the strengths of our, of our results, but also the potential biases in those, in, in, within our results. How do we communicate that back to stakeholders within our organisation? So we need to understand that our overall business decision, our overall business strategy within our organisation, to use the power of analytics within that. So I'm actually a bit early, and that would have. Uh, so apologies that video sort of didn't um, didn't come through, um, but you'll have that within the. Um, you'll have that within the um, when Susanna sends out the material. But that in a snapshot is my feeling about analytics. And I hope that you've just seen that. I hope, that, well, I want to stress that we have a lot of power within, our, within the methodologies that we use, our statistics, our mathematics, our IT, our data mining. But how do we use that of best value within an organisation? And back to Susanna for questions, comments. Thanks very much, Mark. That was very thought provoking. So we do have uh, one question already that's appeared. Um, everyone else, you're welcome to enter questions into the group chat window. So the question is, do you think there's partly a need for proper knowledge of statistics within the business leadership? Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. And I mean, and so also sort of keep in mind that as you say that, so some people will be willing to, will be eager to learn, some people won't. One of the things which I, and probably, well, probably many statisticians, if not all of us, do is when you is when you are to report to a client to not just think how do i communicate how do i work on that specific project how do i communicate the results of that project back to stakeholders but also how do i use that project as an opportunity to learn um, to teach people or even just to challenge people to want to learn more so for example i will always have one well, very, very technical example, but I will always have an appendix within each report I write of here's all the things which I wish people knew about statistics in regard to this this project, and in, and sort of in line of if they do future projects, what do, what do I think people should know. Excellent. Oh, sorry, sorry, and and sorry, and, and the other thing I should sort of say there is with, with that description, I should sort of say that I focused on the methodology, but often there's things which also stakeholders need to know about the working style of analytics. Um, what do I mean by that? So a classic example is often as a stakeholder who's not at all involved in analytics, you will think, okay, I'll just, just give a, a data set to a team to analyze anybody and sort of they'll be able to produce the results instantly. Anybody who's ever worked on a real data set, they will know that actually it takes typically about 70 or 80% of your time required to actually prepare your data for analysis. So those things which are more about the work style of analytics, we also need to make sure our stakeholders know about those as well. Excellent. Um, so I guess for an upcoming statistician, do you have any recommendations where someone could go to learn more about what business needs in data? Yep, yep. So, um, so, what, so I, I would actually go, so, well, so one thing I would say is go back to think about the, again, that's the generic, stereotypical picture that I painted of your, your business analyst, your data scientist, your business manager, your general public. And what I mean by that is, I think that sometimes we, fo that we focus on just on our data scientist, our statistician, how do we talk to them, learn of how they perceive, how they interact with analytics. But it's important to talk to that wider range of different stakeholders within an organization and understand how they feel about analytics. So I think the more that we can do to talk to that wider range of people, the better. I think that, I mean, that's a general, that's a broad picture. 
there are things that we're going to be doing within the Civil Society of Australia, which I'll be announcing shortly. Um, yeah, which I'll, which I'll be able to announce shortly around further training in analytics um, as a okay. very practical note. Great, because uh, one of our other questions, sorry, it sounds really echoey at my end. One of our other questions is just what role can the Statistical Society play in advancing the role of statisticians and data scientists in business? It sounds like you already have some plans in that area. Are you yes. able to share any of your thoughts? Right now they've been, so right now there's, it's been 99% 99 approved. So unfortunately, it hasn't reached the stage where I can actually announce it just yet. But I'm, yes, there will be an event next year in analytics, um, really un unpacking what I've said today um, in a lot more detail, but I just can't announce it just yet. Sure. And, and are there any ways you think the society could better support business analytics in terms of promoting the role of statisticians? Yep. I mean, so, and one thing that we need to think, be thinking about carefully within the society um, and which I've got my own personal feelings on is that within this sort of show, we largely, we largely um, focus on academics for the most part. See, if you look at, for example, at our last couple of conferences, then for the most part, I mean, as a massive generalization, maybe 75% of the people in our community were academics. Um, most of the remainder were, um, uh, were from government. And we only have a few people from the industry within, um, within that demographic. And I think that in the future of the society, we need to think really carefully about how do we engage with that border demographic within, um, the, I mean, not just the, of statistics, but the border demographic of people who want to interact with people in statistics. How do we make sure that we offer, continue to offer programs, activities, events that are high quality for academics so we don't lose that in any stretch of the imagination, but at the same time, how can we better engage with industry with this? Um, and there's, again, some ideas that I have, but um, I need to be diplomatic in how I said I know. Yeah. No, that's great. My, my top is one voice. So I had a few questions around training. So for instance, uh, one person, James Northrop, said that many data scientists that he works with come from IT or database management rather than having a formal statistics background. So what challenges does this pre present to those with a statistics background? Um, so what challenges, so, sorry, baby. <coughs> Me. So, what challenge? So, and again, that, again, that's a fairly it's, 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 um, typical scenario of, that I sort of think of. So, I think that I've, I mean, I've done a little bit within this webinar to challenge people that uh, within the analytics team, the analytics team is not just data scientists, there's business analysts as well. But I think beyond that, and again, that sort of stereotypical example, as you said, Susanna, um, then there's this stereotypical scenario of, and I will hire a couple of IT people, and think just because they're IT people, then they'll be able to analyze all their data for us. So specifically your comment about what can statisticians be doing in this space? And I think that statisticians need to, we need to make sure that as statisticians, we, well, predominantly, we need to think about what sort of training we can be doing often within an organization to not just be the person who's in the corner. I mean, there's a stereotypical picture in the corner analyzing the data within our organization, but we need to be thinking proactively, what sort of training the people need in analytics and that's both understanding what sort of skill sets but also understanding where people are at um what sort of what sort of questions they have of, of, um, of statistics what sort of training can we be offering within our organizations in, in, in statistics um yes so for example one of the things which for me has just happened is earlier this year and i won't say which department but the australian um one of the australian departments down in canberra um, they've recently changed to I'm using, I mean, of all things, using Excel for all their data analysis to using R. And suddenly there was all these questions about what is R, so, um, what is R, how do we best use R within our organisation? The statisticians not, need to not just be the people who are using R, they need to be the people who are understanding what the people within our organisation need to know about R if that's the, if that's the business need. How can we be organising training? Sounds like some big progress is being made in organisations. <laughs> so, so another question around the training, it's just saying at the moment, a good amount of business analysts come from a variety of different backgrounds. They might be technical PhD graduates, engineers, or even general mathematicians. But with the rise of more specialised courses, such as masters in data science or master of 
business analytics, do you see these roles going more toward those who have studied and come from the specialized training, or is there still a place for people to do generalized mathematics, stats, PhDs? Um, so let me sort of so let me sort of paint you the picture for what happens at the University of Queensland right now. The University of Queensland, and again, sort of, um, all the other universities will be in a very similar position. Um, the University of Queensland just happens to be my home university where I work. Within the University of Queensland, maybe three or four years ago, they rolled out the Master of Data Science. Master of Data Science, just teaching the stats, just teaching the data mining, not teaching that bigger context of business analytics. Um, I myself am involved with the School of Business. We are teaching, I'm involved with the teaching three different degrees um, at the, uh, within the School of Business. So we've started with a Bachelor of Advanced Business, to put this in perspective, need, need to be in the top 1% of the state um, to even be, able, be eligible to actually enter that degree. They sort of, they, um, one of the majors in that degree is Business Analytics. So I'm actually writing, the process of writing the materials for all the courses in that major, and we'll be starting to teach some of them um, next year. In addition, we've just, UQ's just right now at the process of, um, this is the very first semester that we've offered our very first online master's degree. Online master's degree, not in, not in business analytics, master's online, uh, master's degree in master's of leadership in the service industry. While it doesn't sound at all like analytics, when the, when the curriculum team sat, that, sat down to work out what they wanted to teach within that degree, first thing they identified they wanted to teach was analytics. So I think that the way the business degrees are in the future, no matter what they're in, they're going, there's going to want to be a, a, a subject in analytics within each of those degrees. Hence, how do we interact with those people who are very much on that periphery of statistics, um, of statistics and analytics, um, to also then in, with, at the early stages of talking about our very first masters in business analytics. Again, business students who are wanting to understand the data science, but also that business environment that um, they, I don't know, the, the context that business environment is within. Also, we're in the process of um, taking some of the learnings, um, teachings, learnings from those degrees, um, having offering that as continuing professional development um, within the School of Business um, for that put a set of stakeholders. Um, and I think that I've digressed enormously, Susanna, but does that, did that answer the question of have I digressed enormously? <laughs> Perhaps a little bit too much digression, although it was okay. very interesting. So it was more, I think, around is there like a, so someone with, say, a PhD in statistics, are they likely to be able to compete against someone who has, say, a master of data science uh, if they're going for a, a data science type position? So my, so my feeling is that we are in the same, we're in the same sort of situation as we were, what was it, 30 years ago, maybe, in the space of computer science. So in the space of so when, when computers first became all the rage, and sort of so now on a business computers were first entering um, the the business world, um, the business environments, then anybody who had any quantitative skills whatsoever were employed as computer scientists. If you if today you you're, you're trying to get a job as in IT and you just know IT, you don't know you don't have a specific um, expertise in a particular area of IT or a particular application area for IT then it's hard to find a job. I think that we're in the same boat today in, in terms of data science. I think um, the, 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 data, the job of a data scientist is often quoted as the job where there's the biggest difference between supply and demand. And then, so as a result, then people are just so desperate for people to enter the field that there's this huge range of people that can easily be employed in data science. In the future of tomorrow, then I think there's, um, I think that there's the full range of jobs within um, the space of data science. Now, I need to say that for myself, I'm very, I, but I personally am on the very much the applied level of statistics. And so I know colleagues in pure statistics, but that's not the space that I work in. But I am conscious that as with the data science evolves, there needs to be that full range of people, uh, people who work in statistics who are, yes, I'm working in statistics, but very much in the application of statistics all the way through to people behind us who are supporting us. And I'm very grateful to people that support me in teaching me the methodologies I need to know, who can be teaching me and our colleagues on it, that underlying, on it, underlying techniques, methodologies within statistics. Great, thank you. So two more questions. Uh, so the first one, 
if business leaders are open to learn more about the relevance of statistics, do you believe that some will fear that the influence of statistics will force them to change against their own mental business models? Yes. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and I mean, and, and to be honest, it's always, to be honest, it's always going to be an interesting challenge because there'll be some business leaders who will sort of say, yes, I want to know what the data is saying, telling me. And if, even if my own inclination is against what the data is telling me, I think I need to start listening to what the data is telling me and to take that on it, to weigh it up as opposed to dismissing it. And there will always obviously be the people who have the personality of this is what I feel and this is, and this is what I feel irrespective of what the data is telling me. There will always be that range of people. Um, but again, what that just says is that maybe as that maybe as, as physicians, we need to know about the personalities of the people that we're working with as the person just on it, the numbers. And speaking of working with them, so at the moment, um, is it more difficult as a data scientist working in a consultancy to provide business value compared to a data scientist working within an organisation? So the internal person has more access to business strategy and business problems than the external consultant. Yeah, I would just say that there's, there, there's, I would say that there's advantages either way. I mean, often the people who are, um, often the people who are consultants, and I'm very much um, a consultant. Often the reasons why I'm why I'm employed, um, often the reasons why I'm employed to work on a particular project, are uh, because people within an organisation um, don't have the capacity. So cap capacity meaning they don't have the uh, manpower to be able to do something or the capability they don't have the technical skills to do something. Um, thinking about that, um, so that's often the, the place where we come in. And, and again, if we think about that capability, it's often, here's a question, we don't know what to do with it. So one of the um, people I'm in touch with right now, so a possible client I'm in negotiations with, burning, camping and fishing, they have a big data set around customer satisfaction forms. They just don't know what to do with the data. So hence, it's not just, we have a specific need, it's we have a general question and we just want to know what actually can be done, that broader question. Um, yeah, so often clients, so what I'm meaning by that is clients often, they know they need to do something. They often need, they're often even looking for advice on what we can do in their link space. So sometimes that's proactive, um, so sometimes that's reactive. But also to say that in their very first meeting as a, cons as a consultant, that we need to make sure the conversation is not just about the specific research question that we need to make sure we include in, that, in those initial conversations an understanding of that where does the project fit in terms of well, yeah, what does the project fit in terms of what's being done within the organization and hence to start thinking about that business strategy as well and if, when we do that we need to explain to clients in order for us to help meet that for us to best meet the needs you have we want to meet those needs please help us to understand those needs, those broader questions of where this project fits in the organisation, so we can opt to offer the best business value to you as an organisation. Great, there's still a role for external consultants. So, yeah, well, sure. so we have one more question. From the work that uh, David White does, he sees a lot of people claiming to be data scientists, but they're really people who know how to cut up a data set, drop it in a geographic application and do some visualizations. So he sees very little genuine statistics, modeling and true data analysis. How can SSA help change the executive view that a dashboard or visualization is actually analytics? <coughs> yeah, so the young, um and so I think that there's, what do I say? I think that the one of the things which, um, and I must, and I must confess that I haven't done this myself, though I probably should. I think that there's a role within the state side of Australia for us to be putting sort of case um, on a, on a case studies um, up on the up on the state side of Australia website. So just to say, well, here's these different ranges of on a CCS. Here's the analytics project. I've got to analyze the project one way. Here's the, here's what I've obtained. I've analysed the project, a, 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 a rich way, a deeper way, the way that is that is decision would, as opposed to just um, the term data butcher. How do I, I don't know, what sort of true value comes from that richer, deeper analysis? The moment that people can see that, then um, yeah, it's for us to be able to post that up on the website, people to see the value in that. And I think that often it comes from the fact that if clients, if all clients have ever seen of analytics, and again, it's is either 
the data butcher, the data butchery. So the idea here is a very simple, quick superficial analysis. If people have only ever seen this sort of analysis, or people have only seen this analysis, and again, as a sort of massive stereotype, um, a statistics project which has been so highly technical, technical in methodology, technical in language, that a person not in statistics won't understand the project. So hence, it doesn't offer value, offer business value because it's not in the form that's understandable by that group of stakeholders. Then it's no wonder that stakeholders will sort of say, well, if that's what data analysis is, this data butchery, then that's how we analyze data. They don't necessarily need, no, they don't necessarily know that that's only the, the starting point for what can be done with data. But I think that if, and, and with that, I think there's not just so much giving the example, it's not just giving the example, it's sort of saying, how does the business value, how does the business, um, how can, the, how this is a better business because of the data, because of this analysis, not just we've done the analysis, but that turned the data into knowledge into business value. How has the business become a better, a better business because of that analysis? The moment the managers see is more money that can be made within the business, then managers would be fully supportive of them. Yeah. So final question, what would you say in consultancies, especially if the client has a general question, then the type of work that you can provide them with tends to be more proof of concept. So the client really wants to develop analytics and maintain the model, rely on it, they need to actually hire someone internally. Um, sorry, 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 Susanna, can you just say the, those last few, few words again? Sure. So if the client really wants to develop analytics and maintain it all, then and, and be able to rely on it, they really need to actually hire someone internal to the organisation. Um, what I say to them, so, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, so, 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 so sometimes, I mean, some, sometimes depending upon the work context, then, then, then as a consultant, we are there to more give business advice. So sometimes there is a role for just saying, yes, well, we've looked at what, you, what you're doing within, the work, within your work context. But sometimes the advice is not, um, I mean, while it's, well, obviously as, as a consultant, we're obviously always fighting on it, one dollar at a time for more work to come into our consultancy. But we sort of sometimes need to sort of say, well, actually, the role within this particular project is to offer that business advice. We need to be able to say what on it, what um, um, what sort of pe people, um, what sort of skill sets, what sort of people organisations need within the organisation. Um, whether that's, I mean, is, but we, I mean, at the same time, is that the best scenario for an organisation in, in the sense of um, if an organisation Often we think about this issue of capability. Capability means, I mean, if, it, if an organisation is you know, needing to, I don't know, hypothetically, needing to do one, I don't know, one week of data, data analytics each year, then there's no, obviously no rationale for hiring a data analyst instead of to do that, or hiring somebody who can do data analytics and as well as I don't know, any number of I don't know, IT statistics things within an organisation. We need to be telling the, the company when they need to bring in somebody internally when to outsource this um, and I think part of your question was if my, if all that I, if my organization if all that I if what I can offer is um, providing proof of concept and that I can't do, and that I actually as a consultancy don't have the skill sets myself or the capability or capacity myself to do more than proof of concept maybe because I'm just starting the space of consulting and so I only have a small team at this point in time then to also think as a consultancy what sort of additional skill sets do I need within my own team in order to provide a better, a um, more complete um, range of capacity and capability to my clients. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think we are just right on time now. So I just wanted to thank everybody again for participating, for attending today. Thank you, Mark, for your informative talk. And I also wanted to actually thank Mark Wicht as well for his amazing technical support behind the scenes. So thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.